Hi there, it's me, Jordan Van Haslow. Welcome to Jordan Van Haslow and Friends live on Hot 702.5 FM Las Vegas. Let's get on with the show. Welcome, 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 welcome to Showtime with Jordan Van Haslow and Friends right here on Hot 7025 FM Las Vegas. Today, I have a new friend. Apparently, it's been a month of new friends. He is a world-renowned hair and makeup artist uh, who's worked all around the world and has shot for Vogue Italy, Vogue Brazil, Vogue Spain, I guess all the Vogues, Elle France, Vanity Fair, Marie Claire, Harper's Bazaar, if I keep going on and on and on and on and on, that'll take up the old hour. But uh, he's decided to take a little moment from his jet setting to come and spend some time with us. So please, please, please welcome Mark Williamson. Hi, Mark. Hey, Jordan. Thank you very much for having me on today. And it's a real pleasure to meet you guys. I've heard so many good things about you and I'm, I'm honored that you took the time to get to know me a little better today. Absolutely. The pleasure's all mine. I've heard nothing, nothing, nothing but great things about you. And so I'm dying to um, to get to know you a little better. In the moment, you're in Miami, yes? I'm in Miami, yes. I generally live half the year in Miami and half in New York. You've got the right idea. Because yes. Lord knows, here in New York, it's been freezing. Like the week or so ago, like it was like 20 degrees, 10 degrees, five degrees. And I started thinking to myself, gosh, you know, no one really has to live like this. Yeah, I hear you. But after after like four years of being a solid and after the pandemic, I was like, no way, I'm not going to spend another winter here. <laughs> I mean, I always backward and went backwards and forwards to Miami anyway, because I have an agent here for work. But I was just like, no, we've been stuck in our apartments for almost two years. I am not doing, I'm not going to br brave the harsh cold snow and the winter. I'm going to Miami. Yeah, totally. Totally. You've got the right idea. I'm curious with that. Um, I've spoken to, especially during the pandemic, you know, a lot of friends of mine who worked in, in as hair and makeup artists um, in entertainment and in advertising, I remember they were all so panicked when shutdown happened because er, everything just stopped. How have you found now that everything is opened again and everyone's, you know, it's kind of business as usual, even though a lot of people who work in corporate jobs aren't necessarily working in the office. Do you find any difference in just your work and your business and, and how people operate now as opposed to pre-COVID? COVID, I guess we'll call it PC. Yes, for sure. I mean, the work is a lot more difficult to get these days mm -hmm. because I think after after the the pandemic and pre, um, through the pandemic, companies were still shooting. They were still shooting stuff in house, but they were bringing no talent in. You know, they were having hair and makeup people talk over Zoom, and the models were doing their own hair and makeup and stuff like that. So a lot of companies then saw a big drop in what they were spending on their yearly budgets. Ah. So a lot, a lot remained that way. We have now started to come back into a little bit of a more fruitful time because I think also people wanted to get out. They wanted to meet people and they wanted to be doing what we do and what we love, which is on location and different people every day. But of course, you know, the adjustments we've all had to make afterwards was the protocols become much more restrictive. Yeah. You yeah. know, everything. Like lots of testing, like, lots of... Testing, not, yeah. yeah. You know, some weeks I could test almost every day of the week. Oh, wow. Because, yes, because you're with different clients. And, you know, some sometimes you were like, okay, I'm good. And it was always like you're playing Russian roulette. Yeah. Yeah, that had to be, I didn't think about that, right? Because so much of what I do, I can do completely solitary. Just coming in out of the pandemic, was there like the apprehension of like, oh my goodness, I want to take this job, but 
wait, I don't know if I feel comfortable being in this room with six people. Like, was there any apprehension in that aspect? Yeah, I think it, I think it made us all a little bit nervous. You know, I actually, I actually lost some friends during the pandemic. And one of, one of them was my superintendent of my, my apartment building. Mm -hmm. And we only lived in, there was only, it was only three story building. Um, but he lived on the, on the ground floor and used to take care. And he like, he like died within two days of getting it. Oh, wow. So then I was, I mean, I've always been, a, I was always a bit neurotic, but then it was like, I would try to like, okay, is, is that worth, is, is it worth the money? You know, yeah. it was like all these questions where before, before the pandemic, you would be like, no, it doesn't matter. I'll take the job. It's fine. It's better to be going out and making money rather than sitting at home and making no money. But then there was like this whole, whole other dimension to your work as such. Also for us as hair and makeup artists, uh, we all had to take, uh, we had to do new qualifications of sanitary testing and all this, all this stuff and clean board testing and everything. So that we had this, this document that we knew the procedures about how to go through the routines of our working days and how every how things needed to be sterilized and how you couldn't use you couldn't cross contaminate one thing to the other. So it became a it became a whole different headspace to be in. You know, you would get home from doing one of these jobs and you'll be like, then it would be like another three hours of disinfecting everything. That's so interesting. I didn't even think about that, especially because you're not just in the space with people that you're using the same brushes, you're using the same, that makes so much mm -hmm. sense. Did a lot of those um, new protocols in terms of like sanitation and hygiene, et cetera, were, were those things that that were um, that the the clients were enforcing, or is that something? Because I know, like, as a hair stylist, you you have to be licensed. Is that is that something that kind of came as like more of like a an actual regulation or, or a law? Yes, a lot of clients were requiring that we did these online courses. You know, for sanit for set was it was called safe sets and sanitary sets. So they gave you you went through this whole procedure. I mean, as a hair and makeup artist we have to sanitize all our things anyway. Mm -hmm. But the whole degree of sanitation like exploded. Yeah. You know, yeah. you can just silly little things like if you touched your mouth or if you touched your mask, you would have to make sure the hands were washed again and the ha sanitized again. I mean, you always sanitize before you touch somebody's face. But then going through boxes and boxes and palettes of makeup and makeup bags and disinfecting everything with like 99% proof alcohol, you know, that would yeah. kill everything. I did, I did this whole other life. When the, when you thought, when a job comes in, you was like, oh my God, this again. Wow. You had two or three models on set. You always have to separate brushes, but it was almost like keeping them away from each other. So oh. <laughs> there was no room for error. Yeah. You couldn't, you couldn't forget and use a, a powder brush on a different girl. Right. Than what it was originally used for, used on. No, totally. Wow. Well, that's intense. Well, we all made it through. Yes. This world is back open. So I'm sorry I started with such a dark topic. <laughs> no, it's fine. You know, hopefully, you know, it brought it brought an, another line of thinking. Well, depending on where you are in the country. Totally. Um, it brought a whole new kind of I can't think of the word. Like a consciousness of like, oh yes. wow, maybe I don't wash my hands as often as I should, or oh exactly. wow, maybe I, I've been too lax with XYZ. <laughs> Yes, or maybe I'm not just going to pick up a cup that somebody's used, you know? All these things that we take for granted, which we all do. And I'm not sounding like I'm some dirty bird or whatever, but, you know, these things we do throughout our lives. No, totally. I remember... Everyday occurrence. There, I remember somebody sent over a meme. This is, like, you know, post-COVID, during COVID, and it just said, do you remember once upon a time how on everyone's birthday we would all 
eat cake after somebody blew on it. <laughs> You know? Exactly. <laughs> or you would take you would take a, the spoon that somebody had put in their mouth. You know what I mean? It mm -hmm. would like a, especially if you're with friends. Totally. You go up and greet your friends and give them a kiss. That whole, that whole, and I work in the fashion industry, so a lot of our a lot of our greeting is, "Darling, sweetie, give us a kiss. Nice to see you. Give us a hug." Uh huh. And when that was taken out of the equation. It became this really bizarre connection we all had with each other because it wasn't as creatives. We all just go into a studio or onto a location shoot and we just express ourselves freely. And, you know, and that involves us being warm with each other and being close and tactile. And all of a sudden it become very clinical. Totally. So a lot of the personality was kind of lost on the shoots. Mm-hmm. Because yeah. do you, do you also, find that any of that is, has has come back at all, or yes, is it kind of like an awkward? They came back. They came back new. instantly because people were so relieved after the whole thing that we could get actually get back out and do what we want, what we love to do. Yeah, and um, big personalities, and because when you're dealing with people, a lot of it is about personalities, you know. One hundred. We all build. We all build these like little relationships over the years that we become like little family on different shoots because it's the same teams you work with but for different clients different teams for different clients but you just move around these teams yeah and so you're all catching up oh you've not seen each other for a couple of months so you're all catching up and with life and hey how's the kids how's your dogs and I think it felt like we had our freedom again once everything was a little more restricted Absolutely. Free, I'm free from you, restrictions. So. You, you said something um, uh, uh, that I think would make a really interesting transition. You talked about doing something you love. So talk to me. Let's go back in time and talk to me. Where did hair and makeup and the fascination and the love and the idea like, oh, I want to do this for a living. How did that happen for you? And at what part, what point in your life did that happen for you? I think it's always been something that was with me from a very, very young age. I was actually, I was actually supposed to be a painter because I painted my entire life since I was like, a like, like a, like an artistic painter or like a house yes. painter. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I can do both. <laughs> And due to my circumstances at home when I was young, I didn't have the right set of circumstances to pursue that. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't living in my parents' home. Uh, this was at like 15, 16. So I had to get a job. Got it. And, wh and where, where was this? Is this because I, I, I know that you're from, you're originally from. I'm from England. Okay. This is in a city called Leeds, which is like 40 North, miles north, right? North. Very far okay. north. About 30 miles from Manchester. You lost the accent. Yeah, I think because I, I used to live in Spain and I used to live in Sweden. So when you're practicing other languages, you know, where I come from, it's like the dialect is really thick. It's like, hey, oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, totally. and I, speak to, I speak to my sister back home and she's like, who do you sound like? <laughs> Um, and then it started from there, you know, it was always kind of an interest I had within the creative, within a creative realm. Um, so hair became my first career. Mm -hmm. um, so I obviously finished my apprenticeship and because where I come from, we not many people, it was kind of, I'm a little bit older than most. And it's kind of frowned upon in the UK if you actually go to college. I'm not saying that you shouldn't, but the better education comes from apprenticeships. Right. Like the so, practical as opposed to the theory. Yeah, and you would just go to like college one day a week rather than spend a whole time at college. And our training is much more intense. It's like three years apprenticeship, then two years vardering. And then I was I was actually head of education for a company. I'd got I'd moved to London after at eighteen. Mm -hmm. When I came back up north around 20, at uh, the age of 26, um, and I started working for this company, a very high-end company in the city, who I'm still friends with today, called Westro. And I became the head of education. So I was in charge of training all their apprenticeships, sorting out their education programs, uh, making seeing them through from start to finish. And that is where I met my first agent. Okay. I actually cut, I actually was cutting her hair. 
I'd always played around with makeup at this point. Mm -hmm. uh, and we were shooting some work for the British Hairdressing, Hairdressing Awards and I would do the makeup. And then uh, my the owners of the company says, okay, we'll pay for you to train in makeup and then we don't need to book anybody outside in. Oh, and wow. I met, I met my first agent, Sam. She was one of my clients and she worked for an agency called Nemesis Models. And the owner of the agency was the manager of a big band called Take That. I don't know if you know them here in, uh -huh. in the U.S. So it was a little bit like the Backstreet Boys. Yeah. So yeah. she just, so she said to me, okay, you know, let's see what we can do with you. We can see if we can develop you and, and stuff like that. And. So eventually I started working. She started getting me these bookings to the point where I had to put the education down to part time so I could. So that you could pursue all of these wonderful opportunities. So tell me this, when you first you know, started working in hair and you became the, hair, the head of education, was the idea of working in fashion and entertainment on your radar? Or were Not you in the slightest. Not in the slightest. I mean, obviously being... Uh, in that industry, you've always got to, you're always a keen follower of fashion and, you know, it's something that guides you, but it's not something that I'd actively pursued. Right. I wanted to pursue, but, because also I, I was, I'm from the north of England, it was something I didn't even know how to go about. Right. So no, for me, it sense. was like, it was going to be, okay, this is salon life. And uh, okay, you'll work your way up the chain and then there would eventually be an opportunity to open your own place. Um, but it didn't quite pan out that way. Yeah, well, it sounds like it panned out in a much more exciting way. I'm yes, just... and that was, that was the thing for me. Once I had a taste of working as a session stylist, freelance, I kind of decided I liked the freedom of that and I kind of, Love the fact that I didn't have to be in this one space with the same people day yeah. in, day out from nine to five or 10 to eight. Totally. Um, you got to meet all these interesting, wonderful people that traveled in from all over the place that had different lives from yours and experienced different things. So yeah. that was kind of my major step. And I'm truly always will be grateful to Sam um for giving me that opportunity yeah so is there one job that you can remember like one opportunity that kind of really and it, maybe it was just meeting sam and sam beginning to represent you but was there after that was there like kind of like the next opportunity that was like okay i've done this and it kind of immediately kind of took me to the next level and expanded my reach and expanded the opportunities that were presented to me yeah, I mean, I used to work with, in in the UK, where, where my market was to start with, um, my biggest opportunities came later when I arrived to the US. Um, I used to work with a photographer called Nikki Johnson, and we would do lots of celebrities, um, but more like soap celebrities. There's a big, we have a, we have a long run in what you would call a soap opera, we call it a, a program called Coronation Street in the UK. I don't know if you've ever heard oh, of it. Oh yeah, of course. I'm I'm familiar with it. I'm very familiar with it. Yeah. And we would work with all the all the all the actors and actresses of that for like OK magazine and and any publications and for the award ceremonies. And there was another spin-off show called Hollyoaks, which was mm -hmm. so it was all these young teen actors and actresses and some older actors and actresses. So you kind of got you kind of got put into that market, you know what I mean? And totally. we worked all the time because obviously storylines were shooting. And so once I got I got in that door, then the work started to come. Oh, that's awesome! That's awesome. You know, you... Because, like I said, they're, they're cons consistently shooting. There's always something for some publication because they keep up with their personal lives. They keep up with story lives and storylines and so it was always that but I think my biggest break was when I actually came to the U.S. Awesome so how did that happen how did, how did you, you um, 
I've been here just about three months. Um, and I was like, oh my God, what have I done with my life? Why am I here? I have no friends. I don't know anybody. Did, well, did, how did you even get here? Did you come for a job or was it like, you I know? I had an agent here that was sponsoring me, sponsoring me to come here. So I, I, I guess, let me, let me rephrase that. I guess my question is, was it like one of those things like, yeah, I want to go and it wasn't, visit in it America wasn't, or was it like a, hey, you should really come over here. And it wasn't something I, I thought about, to be honest. And I met a partner that I was dating overseas. Okay. So he lived here in Miami. Got um, it. So that was kind of, I was living in Barcelona at the time. Uh, so that was kind of the push. It was something when I was young, I was like, okay, yeah, I want to go to New York and, you know, that's where I want to be. And, but then this whole thing happened and I never, I sort of put it on the back burner. And yeah. then I met this guy and it was like, I lived in Spain. He couldn't speak Spanish. And it was easier for me to, with my line of work, to just find an agent or a sponsor than him to come to Europe and have to like settle in and, you know. Learn the language. Learn the language job. and be <laughs> away from all your Americans. Where for us Europeans, we're so used to just be just nipping two hours to another country and not thinking anything about it. You know what I mean? 100%. Um, so then I met, I met my first sponsor here. So I thought, okay, I'll give it a shot. Um, so we went through, we did all the immigration and everything and stuff like that, but it was taking so long. Um, and at this point I was like, oh my God, this thing is not even meant to happen. I'm not coming. Uh -huh. So, and then me and the, the guy I was dating at the time, we broke up. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, oh my God, I've packed up all my life, sold up all my life in Barcelona to move to Spain. I had to move to the U.S. and we're not even dating anymore. Oh, my, and how long had you lived in Spain? Uh, for four years. Okay, so that's a long, that's a nice enough yeah. time to like, yeah. oh, you've, you've established yeah, a circle of friends, you've it. established a routine, yeah. 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 So, so in the meantime, my mother, my mother was sick. She was, she was dying, unfortunately. So I went back to England. Mm -hmm. to wait for the papers and then this, we all we broke up and everything and then I didn't even think anything about it and then finally my papers came through so I thought okay I have this opportunity now what do I do with it do I sit here I'm not in Barcelona I've given up my life in Barcelona I'm back in my home city of Leeds uh, do I just sit here and let it pass me by, or do I take the opportunity to go? And after some thought, I'd already left the UK one, twice, one, mm -hmm. once to go to Sweden, and then once to Barcelona. So I thought, well, what's the worst that can happen? The worst that can happen, if it doesn't work out, I come back. You come home. That's all, yeah, that's, and that's home. always the thing, right? I always think about that. You know, when I've spoken to people who have like had like really scary, like what, what what sometimes they think are scary opportunities, like you know, my life, my family, my friends, they're all here. And I, how am I supposed to just you know travel to the other side of the world and leave it all behind? And like you said, if it doesn't work out, if you don't like it, go home. <laughs> exactly. I mean, don't get me wrong; it, op it unleashes a whole new set of insecurities, insecurities that you never realized you had. Mm -hmm. But it's like. At the end of the day, I can get back on the flight. And I came with a return flight. So I was like, that was my safety net. So I arrived in Miami and I'd been here for like three months. And I was like, oh my God, I'm just, can I really stand in here? Because obviously I didn't know anybody. Uh, and then I met a, great, a brilliant photographer who's a very dear friend of mine now called Billy Coleman. Mm -hmm. Um, we'd done some, sh we'd done a shoot together. And then he introduced me to another friend of mine called Danny Santiago, who then, who's a very amazing, famous stylist, is now working on Sex in the City at the moment. Oh, wonderful. Um, 
So he, he anything that was of any substance, he was working on and shooting here. So I, my friend Billy brought me into a shoot with him where he was styling and he loved what I did. So then he introduced me to my new agent, Tanya. So then I, I was like, okay, Tanya's great. She's fantastic. So I signed with her and then, Bill, and then Danny also introduced me to an amazing photographer friend of mine, Greg Loders, who at this time was shooting everything for Italian Vogue. Mm-hmm. So Danny had pushed and pushed and pushed for me to be on this set for, for the shoot for Italian Vogue. This was in 2014. And so it was met with a little apprehension because nobody really knew anything about me. Uh-huh. You know, they're not, I'd not been here long enough for anybody to see enough of my work or what I did. But luckily for me, Danny persuaded the photographer and they let me on. Oh, that's wonderful. And the so rest of- That was the most nerve wracking and the most door opening job of my life. Yeah. So I would say, here I am, this little guy from Leeds and all of a sudden now, this one of my lifelong dreams is, is coming that I am shooting Italian Vogue. Yeah. So you- I was like petrified, but from that opening, the same day, because uh, somebody had called Vanity Fair Italia had called my agent, so she's always on set for Italian Vogue right now. So they booked me for three continual shoots for Ital- Vanity Fair Italia. That's so, so wonderful. Yeah. So this I was find like- it funny. I find it funny you 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 can't you had to come stateside to get all of this work. Yeah, to get for all European of... publications. <laughs> yes, no, that's right. Yeah, isn't it bizarre? That's what they say. There's an old saying. There was a show called Living Single, and there's this episode where one of the characters, and it's like a like the episode takes place in like kind of like the jazz age, and she's a a, a singer, you know, like a cabaret singer, a nightclub singer, and like one of the things that one of the characters says to her really resonated with me. He says. You got to go around the world to play the club down the street. And it's, it's exactly true. It's exactly true. And, you know, from that, you know, all the other, other magazines came. And, like, even with the Vanity Fair, they'd still not seen my work. Mm-hmm. But because I was on set shooting, I, I just because, okay, he's got is credible enough to be working on Vogue Italia, which was one of the biggest publications, the most the most fashionable publication of the Vogue series, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, were you were you at this point, were you doing um makeup yet? Or were you Yes, makeup? I was doing makeup and hair, but I was only doing hair on the shoot. Got it. Because when, when it comes to big shoots like that, we generally do one or the other. Got it. Got it. how did how did how did how did at, at what point and how did you transition into um learning the art of makeup? And I trans- transitioned into the art of makeup back in back when I was back in Leeds and being an educator. Oh, okay. It was something I'd always played around with. Like I would do my mother's hair and makeup when I was young and you know, and I was part of that whole gothic new romantic era so I would do my own makeup and I I pretty didn't look didn't look like I look now <laughs> one thing I can say I think I've got better with age well, <laughs> you Cheers know people say oh I was great when I was young but no I think I was kind of like this little squeaky voice kind of blonde, very feminine. Most people thought I looked like my brother's sister. <laughs> and then I'm, I'm glad I filled out a bit later on in life. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so my makeup started off kind of then. And then obviously when I met my first agent, I was doing hair and makeup on the shoots. God. So it gradually progresses. But it's it's like this industry is is continually evol- evolving and it's it ne- you never stop learning i will never stop and i can always learn something from some somebody whether it's the new kid on the block or the old kid on the block yeah 
everybody always has something to teach. Yeah, and in saying that, that makes me think about the fact. So being in fashion, um, you know, like you say, always learning. Part of that is because things are always evolving, right? New trends, new fads. Maybe we go back to something old. Do you find that in your line of work, you kind of see things happening or trends coming like long before kind of the general public does like, you know, oh my gosh, I, I worked on something like that three months ago and now everybody's doing it. Like, do you, do you find that that happens a lot? Yeah, that happens quite a lot. Cause you have to, you have to understand that a lot of like, say if we we're shooting campaigns and stuff, mm -hmm. you know, we're shooting these campaigns or these advertising things or magazines probably six months in advance. Right. So we get it. We get it. The good thing about we can, the good thing about, that is we get a voice of being able to partake in what we think are trends and what is up and coming at the same time. So we can tend to create a bit more of the trend rather than just follow it. Totally. You know, because a lot of our trend stuff is brought from nostalgia. You know, we will always, we'll always, everything has, everything has gone round the block four or five times. Right. Well, because... So I'm sorry, so, I didn't mean to have to go on. Because that's where, you know, when we look back at the old masters, that's where these old techniques come from, you know? So, and a lot of that is being reintroduced into our creative market again, you know? Like people are going back to shooting with film and, you know, we're looking at old makeup style, old makeup ways and how in the 1920s, what they would do and, you know, their, their whole process. Yeah. When you say, so when you say old masters within your world, are there like a handful, number of people who, who like, you like this individual back in 1935 made a complete impact on how hair is done or how certain techniques are done. This particular makeup artist developed this and was seen for the, doing this for the first time in 1954. And it's something like, are there specific people that you and your colleagues kind of cite and say like, you know, that this person would be considered an old master. That person is something, somebody that, you know, we all use as a reference point, that type of thing. There's, there's a lot to, there's a lot to kind of thing. You know, a lot of my inspiration comes from old photographers, you know, uh, you know, just the whole dynamic of, of course, I hit a blank now. Whatever. <laughs> uh, but I get it. But just certain aesthetics and certain Paul things. Paul Newton and Avidon and all them pioneers of the industry, you know, and yeah. like Vidal Sassoon and, you know, how he was, uh, he, he and how he created these whole new nuances that would explode into a market that even in our industry now we all work around the same principles of what these guys taught and how their main style was everything is based around the bob or everything is based around the shag you mm -hmm. know what i mean and yeah so it's funny how we look at it like that Totally. So in terms of like, you know, like saying having a voice in these trends, can you uh, just very top line, walk me through. So say you're doing a campaign for a specific publication. At what point, you know, versus the, the, the creative director and the art director, at what point are you brought in? You know, is it, is it kind of like, hey, this is what we see, make it happen? Or are you part of the conversation and part of the dialogue with like a creative director um, as they're creating that vision or as they're um, envisioning it and putting it together, putting their thoughts together? Not generally as they're putting their thoughts together. The creative directors will generally get their whole idea and thought process in a line, put together mm -hmm. mood boards and, um, and direction, model selections, what what the story of the brand is mm -hmm. and then we will be brought into at a later date once the selection is then once we get our, our bookings or whatever the clients um uh, and the art director will then have a conversation with us about okay well this is what we're aiming for 
what do you think of this? Should we go down this route or will this hair work better? Some, this makeup or this color in, you know, we got to spring, think spring, summer. And then we take a look at the clothing that's selected, you know, mm -hmm. and then we will sit down on the day, me with the photographer, the creative director, the client, and we'll all talk about, okay, this is where do we want to go? How, and then this is where I can bring in some of my own personal experience. You know, if you have a model that has a certain look, it's like, well, let's try and bring out that look. Maybe not what you have had in mind, but I see her face. You know, if we she has a little bit of a vintage face, so we'll work with clean or more porcelain skin, look a, a little bit of ruddiness in the cheeks. You know what I mean? And mm -hmm. just to bring her alive and about making her feel her best. Sometimes it works. Sometimes you get the go ahead. Sometimes you get pulled back. Yeah. But it's always about having open discussions because at the end of the day, we're there to execute the best of our ability for the client and their personal needs. Totally. Like at, at the end of the day, it's a collaborative effort, right? Like yeah, you... some clients um, give you more freedom than others. Some are very, very specific. Some book you in there because they want your creativity. Yeah. What, 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 if you were to think back on your career and all of the, the, the shoots that you've participated in and all of the places you've worked, is there um, an experience that really stands out either as a result of what happened during the experience or as a result of the final product? Is there like that, that one Thing that you're always like oh my god that was so awesome or oh my goodness that was the most that was just a wild two-day experience oh yeah there's kind of a few right well it was once i was shooting for an english um clothing department store and we were shooting up in the mountains of morocco um as one does as one does, just but to like just this sleepy little village. No, you these little villages. There was no the only thing that was there was like some couple of homes, the slaughterhouse, this little cafe. Um, we all had to. We, had, we obviously we were shooting, so we all had to have lunch. So we sat down in this what was supposedly cafe. So they provided the menu. Um, we're all like, yeah, chicken is the, the safe the safe bet. All the time you can hear the sheep screaming in the background while they're being slaughtered in the slaughterhouse. <laughs> Which was just like, oh my God, these poor things. You just wanted to go serve them. So we're like, oh yeah, we'll have chicken. The next thing we didn't realize, but there's this like, um, you call it a sloth tray or a sloth pipe underneath our feet, underneath the table. And all of a sudden, you saw this blood running through down this like little narrow alley, the galley between the, the table. And it was only the blood of the chickens that they were beheading in the back to feed us. And it was the most, <laughs> it was the most, I mean, I'm not vegetarian, but after that moment, I was like, I can't eat that. It's just <laughs> there. Well, on... because something about when we buy processed meat and stuff like that from the supermarket, we don't have to think about where it's come from. No, totally, totally. Well, isn't that what they say? Like, don't my great grandfather, my great grandfather, my grandfather, um, you know, before he retired back in like the fifties and the sixties, he worked in the in the stockyards doing just that. Um, so I can I can't imagine what that must do to your thought and your appetite. But what I will say. Being a glass half full guy, at least you know that the chicken was fresh. Yes, of course, for, <laughs> sure. for sure. But I think there were about five of us at the table that didn't eat anything till we got back to the hotel. <laughs> well, but, this, but I guess it, it goes to show sort of like the business that you're in. Presentation is paramount. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and then there was another time we were shooting in Borneo for a Swedish company, you know? Some of these, some of these shoots, I mean, we're very privileged to go around the world and, you know, I'm truly grateful and truly lucky without that sounding like a cliche. 
Um, but a lot of these, sometimes they can be tinged with so much enlightenment and that brings such humility to you. You know, we're shitting in, in the jungle in Borneo and it's like these families living in these wood huts that had nothing, you know, and they had to like walk on this plank walkway through this swamp and have every day of their lives. And you know, and these people, they came to us and they wanted us to sit and talk with them and they welcomed us. And you know, and here we are, we're, we're going back to a five-star luxury hotel. Uh-huh. Um, yeah. Where the people, people that are just, okay, well, okay, maybe, maybe the wine's not cold enough or maybe this, and these people were, Happy as anything. I'm not saying that, that happiness is related to poverty, but you know these these moments in your life bring such humbleness mm -hmm. about how our lives are really not bad. You come home with a whole new perspective. Totally, totally. And I guess you also really start thinking about how much you have. And granted, you work for it, but how much you, you take for granted. Exactly, you know, we complain if, you know, we haven't, we can't go to the din to the restaurant we want to tonight, or we can't get in, or, you know, we can't buy them new shoes at six hundred dollars. Do you know what I mean? It's, and then yeah. these people are making, they're making like shoes out of plastic cups, and, you know, so, so I'm, I mean, that's one of the beautiful things about my job is. And about traveling the world with, with my career is mm -hmm. I've got to experience so many sides of life. Um, do that you find I, that that informs your, even just the, the work you do and some of the ideas that you have, like things that you see, like, oh my goodness, there's this woman I can remember in this little teeny tiny mountain village. And I'll never forget just the way like, her hair was laying under her scarf and it like you, you... Ex exactly you know and you also find these traditional things that they do these little tricks that you pick up on that you can use in your daily life but you know and you then become really empathetic empathetic to the human nature in general Mm -hmm. you know of course we're not all perfect we do get into our arguments so we see red sometimes but I have, for me now, with the amount I've traveled, I have a better understanding of who I am and, and and a better understanding of the needs of other people before my own. Yeah, yeah, that makes perfect sense. That makes absolutely perfect sense. And I think that's something, as you get older, I think when we're young, we're like, we're we want designer clothes, we want this, we want to be at the parties, we want to be with the in crowd. And as you get older, it becomes a whole new sense of worth. Totally. I, I think also, at least for me, the older I've gotten, you realize when you're only just hanging out at the A-list parties and with the, the in crowd, like you say, it's really, even though people may come from like all kinds of places and different countries and walks of life, it's really a pretty narrow experience because everyone's really going after the same thing and kind of pigeonholing themselves in the same thing in a way. Exactly, that you know, and everybody's chasing that next, that next dream, you know, so yeah. all these people are going for the same dream. Yeah, so... Uh, I'm sorry, go for it, keep continuing. No, you're, you're good, you're good. Go yeah, I, so so with that said, um, everybody chasing for, for, for the different dreams and also, you know, Europeans are very different than Americans and, you know, Italians are very yeah. different than Germans. Do you find um, when you're working on set, say with an American, like since you've been here in the States versus when you were in Sweden or uh, when you were in Spain, do you find, do you, do you feel or see or experience a marked difference in how the the crews interact with each other? Based oh, on yeah, for from? sure, for sure. Yeah. I mean, I'm English, so a lot of our humor is very sarcastic and um, I wouldn't say bitchy, but, you know, when where I come from in the north of England, if we like somebody, we tear you to pieces. 
Mm-hmm. Like really that's how, the horn. Yeah, that's, that's our relationship with each other. You know, that's if we're not ripping you to pieces, then you need to be worried. You know what <laughs> I mean? Yeah. Um, so a lot of our humor is like that. And like my European friends I'm on European sets, they don't get it. They think we're just mean to each other. <laughs> they're like, why do you talk to each other like that? And we're like, no, it's humor. But then also, I think some of my American friends, uh, the American crews, Unless I traveled, they don't kind of get my humor. And I, and, you know, and sometimes I have to like draw it back a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Because what I would say to an English person can offend an American person. Right. No, that uh, makes sense. Where we would find it funny. So, yeah. And then in Sweden, um, <laughs> that's a whole other ball game. I think also something I found some things get when you don't speak the language where I spoke the language roughly, but when you don't know a language fully, a lot of things get lost in translation. So I couldn't really say whether we behave differently or not. Most of the time I didn't know what they were talking about. Because there's no nuance. You, yeah. you don't there's, have no nuance. there's no yeah, nuance. There's no humor. Totally. There's no there's nothing there. You don't pick up on it because your brain is too busy trying to translate. Yeah. Um, so I couldn't tell you. I mean, the good thing about Sweden was everybody spoke perfect English, so you didn't really need to learn, but I wanted to challenge myself. But I only challenged myself while I was there, and that was it. How long were you in Sweden? Uh, for three and a half years. Okay, that's a nice period of time. Stockholm. That's a nice period of time for a challenge. Yeah. <laughs> and it was good there. You know, there's a lot of work there. The market is really good. And the Swedish are very... They're very proud of what they do. You know, they're very creative and they have a beautiful aesthetic and they produce all the time. It's almost like they had to pr- prove themselves to the world. Yeah. Now you see Swedish design all over the world. But there was a pr- uh, a point where it was like this ever-churning cycle of producing and producing, you know. They have three fashion weeks a year. Yeah. Um, and they have the El Garland where where they recognize all the creative talents, you know, they, it's like an award ceremony, but for the creative industry, like stylists, photographers, makeup artists, art directors, you know, they treat it totally different. Well, Me? Spain, Spain is another ball game altogether. <laughs> How so? Yeah, it's like, oh, it's also mañana, mañana, it's very laid back and very chilled, and, but nice. Right, but it is, it doesn't have that like hurry up. I need this yesterday. That no. like say in London. You know, or you York have is. a couple of hours for lunch, and <laughs> you know, not like here in the U.S. They needed it three weeks ago. I remember um, having one of my favorite holidays I ever went on. I went to the Canary Islands. Okay, yeah, it's very. And I, I was in, and I would never forget like the whole concept of the siesta because you know, this is I was younger too. I was like in my twenties, so you know, we're like partying, partying, partying all night. And I'd wake up at like twelve, twelve thirty, so hungry, and I couldn't find a damn thing to eat because everyone was on their siesta. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> and I just couldn't. And I, I think the entire time I was there, my my first meal every morning was. Uh, a Chinese restaurant, Chinese food, because the Chinese restaurant in the Yumba was the, the only place open. That's the only place open. <laughs> that's a culture, that's a culture within itself, you know? It's like, the the wonderful thing about that, though, is that your your life becomes much more social. Oh, totally. You know, like when I lived in Spain, I would see my friends every day. We would have breakfast in the morning or grab some lunch or maybe an early dinner, you know, and in July everybody goes on vacation, everything yeah. closes. Yeah. So everybody gets a month's vacation. Yeah. Maybe you know what I mean? Where, with the big difference. Of, the focus I mean, isn't on work and the focus isn't on like the next thing and how do I get the yeah. next rung and who who's on the other side of that table? Let me, cause like at LA, we just spent time in LA. I find that really interesting in LA, how you can like, literally you think it's a almost like a stereotype but it's like really true like you can be having lunch with someone in LA and the entire time you think you're conversing with them they're literally just scanning the room looking to see 
That's LA for you. Who yes. else better might be there? So we're gonna have to wrap up really soon. So I have a question for you though, because it's so yes. interesting to talk about um, all of these different places that you've lived in and, 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 and what those experiences were like and what the people and the culture is like. Where have you not gone that is your is is like at the top of your list of I would like to I mean I visited, but I would like to spend some time living there in Paris. Yeah. I've never, you know, of all Paris these, or Milan. I've never actually been to Paris. That's one of the few places I've not been. It's one of the most magical places you should go. And I think for fashion, um it's one of the most innovative places. Mm -hmm. You know, I've lived in London. There's only like, for my work, there would only be like Milan or Paris. And I, um, I think I could deal with uh, Paris a little easier because the French are a little, I, I shouldn't really say this. Um, <laughs> so I won't say it because I don't want to offend any of my French friends. Um, the French are a little more reserved uh -huh. So then it's a little more quieter. Do you know what I mean? That makes sense. Yeah. That makes that well, makes the Italians sense. are a little more active. Mm -hmm. So more animated. even though I have yeah. a lot of Italian clients, um, and I love the Italians, they're super passionate about everything. No, but again, it's just sort of like more animated, a little more. Yes. I, I understand. It's like it's like the difference again from like an LA to a New York to a Miami. Exactly. It's the personalities and and the the um just the cultural norms and the and the and the social graces and the just the way people interact with each other what's considered acceptable versus what exactly you know so i totally understand that like i, I could never ever see myself living in la i mean it's very beautiful but after living in new york and living here and living throughout europe i i i don't i can't get into the vibe i don't understand the vibe you know for me it's it's a, it's its own like you know it's 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 really its own place and so it's like you either dig it and get it yes um I remember moving and I'm just gonna kind of close with this and, and this is something I so I moved to L A um to work for a studio and one of my colleagues at the time here in New York he was born and raised in L A and he had moved um to New York to work for our company. And as I was, right when I was, you know, wrapping up about to leave, he comes up to me and he says, here's something that someone told me when I was making the move to New York. And if you can wrap your mind around this, you're going to do okay in LA. New York, well, LA is yes, 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 no. Whereas New York is no, 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 yes. Yeah, that's exactly right. You yeah. know? And and I remember moving there and and taking that with me. And it's like, oh, I get it. Yeah, these people are totally opposite of everything that I know. But okay, I get it. It's almost like learning to speak a new language, except it's yeah. like an emotional intel language of emotional intelligence. Yeah. Yeah. Um, oh yeah, my god. It's funny that it actually kind of rings kind of true, right? Totally. totally. And I, I think obviously then you know you see why the energies are different because in New York with everybody saying no, it dry it gives you that fight, you know, it kicks you exactly. up to exactly. let the city kick you, kick you down every day, but you still get up and you go, you go hustle. Exactly. Because when things are so easy that don't ever become fruitful, then it's, it's just, it's a bigger letdown, I think. 100%, 100%. Listen, I've had so much fun getting acquainted with you. And the next time you're in New York or the next time I'm in Miami, we have to, have to, have to, have to, have to get together in person. Because I, I I think you're so fascinating and so funny and so interesting. That sounds great. And it's been such a pleasure talking to you too. And thank you ever so much for having me on the show. Awesome, wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Mark Williamson. I hope you have a fantastic rest of your day. And I look forward to getting together uh, uh, very, very soon. And thank you, everybody out there in Radio Land for joining us and uh, getting to know, uh, sitting with me and getting to know a little bit more about Mark. We'll see you next week, or, or you'll hear me next week on another episode of Showtime with Jordan Von Haslow and Friends right here on Hot 702.5 FM. Las Vegas. Hi there, it's Jordan Von Haslow. Yes, that's right.
that Jordan Van Haslow. I don't know if you know this, but everyone's favorite radio show and podcast is now available on Spotify. That's right. Showtime with Jordan Van Haslow and Friends, my weekly one-on-one chat with some of the most interesting people I know from the entertainment and the arts communities can now be streamed on Spotify. Uh Uh-huh, that's right. I share real estate with Michelle Obama. Click the link and be sure to subscribe. 